Welcome back. Well, as you can see, I am working without a net today. I think that my Bell's Palsy recovery has gone far enough so that I'm willing to try working without having my face taped. The reason that I kept tape on my face, usually when I was doing videos, not all day long or anything like that, is because it makes it easier for me to speak and I think it makes it easier for you to understand me. You know, right now there's very little muscle tone because of the paralysis. So my cheeks are getting in the way of, of my speaking. But because I, I have to get a break from the tape and because I made five videos yesterday which means my tape my, my face was taped up like all day long i need a little breather so we're going to try it if it works great if it doesn't it's not like i don't have a whole roll of tape and it's not like i don't have a physical therapist who is more than happy to tape the daylights out of me so we'll give it a try you let me know if the speech is too slurred and too garbled for you to understand what I'm saying, let me know in the comments. I'm, I'm not going to continue to work without the tape if it's something that makes things difficult for you on your end in terms of understanding me. But also gives you a chance to see how the recovery has progressed because you really have not seen my face without it being you know taped up and so here it is as you can see i have no reason not to expect a full recovery all right when we get back For antiques today by the way my phone is not turned off whenever I have been foolish enough to do a video with my phone left on somebody calls me and it's never anything important but I need it for this video so we're gonna keep our fingers crossed that everybody's forgotten my number off at Bedford antiques today picking up little stuff the last several shopping videos have been window shopping at Lutz Antiques where they have big beautiful case pieces. Um, I'm going to have to show you the wolf because I did show you the bear coat rack. There's a giant stuffed wolf. That thing's got to be seven feet tall and that is still in the, the film that I had taken there that I haven't shown you yet. As I said the last time I went there I filmed absolutely everything so now we're working on bedford and this was not just window shopping this was buying and buying for resale so the first piece that i saw i i don't think i had been in that store like literally 45 seconds when this really lovely asian vase probably Japanese. I'm going to have to do some research on it. Um, and it just sort of screamed to me, come get me, which of course I did. Here you go. Just barely got into the door and here we go. Let's take a closer look at this. Twenty dollars. it around because the thing that I'm afraid the camera won't capture is the three-dimensional quality of the glaze. Very, very interesting piece. No idea how old it is. 
I'm going to have to do a little research on this piece. It's nice. For $20, am I going to take this home? Oh, yeah. No question about it. That was just such an impressive piece. Uh, that is not going in my Etsy shop right away. I really have to do some research on that. I'm now that I've had a chance to roll it around in my head, I'm pretty comfortable with the notion that it is Japanese. Uh, I am thinking it is probably early 20th century, but a piece like that, I want to do some research on it. Uh, very nice piece, and who knows, it might even stay here. Uh, not that I need to keep any more stuff. So I went right back that same booth, um, walked in, found several more pieces. Now, next up, let's take a look at the two I bought. All right, two Nippon pieces. Let's take a look at this first. This piece was probably a dresser bowl uh a hair receiver, it would have had a lid of some sort, but it's beautiful, lovely piece. It's dirty, it needs to be cleaned up, but when it's cleaned up, it's going to look great. Now, why would I buy it with no lid? Well, here's your answer right here, two dollars, that's why. And this is a nice little Nippon tray, um, one dollar, so you gotta know they're coming home with me. All right, we're gonna go back and take a look at the shop where I have gotten these last three pieces. Right over in that far corner bookcase is where I got the Nippon pieces. And over here, in that tall white bookcase, is where I got that interesting Asian vase. All right, those were two really nice little Nippon pieces. Um, we had that lidded bowl minus the lid. So... As I mentioned in the video, why would I take it? Two dollars is why I would take it. A piece like that has so many uses even without the lid. My first thought was, oh, I could shove a plant in there. Would that not make a great little planter? What about stuffing it with potpourri? Uh, so many things you can do with a piece like that even without the lid. For two dollars, how could I walk away from it? And then the little square flat tray, also Nippon. I have no idea what's going on in that particular booth. There are pieces uh, that are valuable, and the Nippon pieces marked at a dollar or two. There are pieces that are crap. And like literally broken pieces of things, things that, you know, are, you can see the cracks that's glued together, pieces missing that have zero value, none. You know, you throw it in the trash because it is worthless. Either that or you pack it up, you stick it in a box, you send it off to somebody like Colleen or Lisa or Karen and say, take a hammer to this and turn the piece. Randy, my goodness, Randy does that. Take a hammer to it, crack up the pieces and turn it into jewelry or some repurposed art because as it stands, it is of zero value. Then they'll have a 20 or $30 price tag on things like that. I love dealers like that. I love them because, of course, I'm not going to buy the broken stuff that is overpriced, but I am going to go after the good stuff that they don't recognize. So, wish the world were full of more of them. There was another interesting piece there, and I do want to show you this. 
So let's take a look. I, oh, by the way, I did not buy this. Well, what we have here is a very pretty lusterware piece for ten dollars. Now, here, let's get up there so that I can. It's unmarked, but the design here is very Japanese. However, the lusterware, this pearlescent, iridescent, picking up all kinds of different tones, is not typically Japanese. So, also, this sort of speckled gold edging is not typically Japanese. That's more European. It's unmarked. $10 without knowing even where the piece came from and not being able to make an educated guess. Well, the answer is I'm going to have to pass on it. That was a really, really interesting little piece of lusterware. Just looking at it on the surface, that iridescent glaze, sort of mottled, and we've talked about this before, that is the earmark of Czech and Austrian lusterware, Bavarian lusterware, essentially, you know, the Germanic um, countries, their lusterware, along with that spattered uh, gilding around the edges. It's, it's not a line of gold the way the Japanese would have done it. It looks like somebody flicked the gilding on. Interesting piece. The design in the front, however, was very Japanese. And with no mark, I wouldn't want to get involved in picking up a piece like that. I could find it's not at all what I think it is because, you know, I'm clearly seeing different things when I look at it. And even though I'm sure it was worth what they were asking for it, I have to make sure it's worth more because I'm buying it for resale. Um, let's see. Oh, so I stopped at another booth and just saw a really interesting Art Deco piece. Let's take a look. Well, let's take a look at this. Let me get this out of here. Now let's back up so you can see the whole thing. This is an Art Deco vase. Uh, it's gilded and let's get a close-up of this and it is a woman sort of leaning backwards holding a basket the price on this is $23 now that's a very good price and if I wanted the piece myself I would take it home I am not taking it home for resale because at $23 I would have to price it at at least $30 or $35 uh, and that would barely even justify the space it would take in my Etsy shop and I'd rather keep my prices under $20 so just FYI if you like Art Deco and you're in the market here it is now, a piece like this, which is gilded, and that's real gold, that's how they did it. There was some rubbing to the gilding. Um, $23, fair price, if I wanted to take it home for myself. If I'm going to pay $23 for something, throw it in my Etsy shop, I want to make sure the gilding is not rubbed. That's like number one. I'd like to make sure it's marked or at the very least that there are enough identifiers so that I can do the research and tell the buyer what it is. My best guess just off the top of my head would be that that was an American piece definitely Art Deco that that's just so Deco uh, and you can see the Art Nouveau influence in it, too. Remember, Nouveau comes before Deco, and some of the common themes are those naked ladies. I know, 
naked ladies in art. It's always been a common theme, goes back to the Greeks. But that is the sort of piece that, like I say, if you want to take it home for yourself, oh yeah, good bargain. If you want to resell it, well, unless you're going to throw it up to auction and say, you know, caveat emptor and, you know, let your buyers choose the price, I really feel you need to do a lot more in terms of research than I would be prepared to put into it because at $23, I'm going to have to bump that up. Um, I would not even make back my costs unless it was going over 30 And if I'm charging more than $30 for something, I really need to make sure my buyers know what they're getting. All right. Um, oh, the booth across the way from that Art Deco lady was full of clocks. So, not in the market for a clock and we're, so we just went in for the sake of looking but take a look at these um what we would com commonly call grandfather clocks technically they are tall case clocks that's what they're called um well very pricey but let's look well not something i'm in the market for but we have a whole selection of tall case clocks, what we would call grandfather clocks here. Price range is from about $1,500 to about $3,500. So they are not coming cheap. But I figured we would take a look. I'd like you to know what's available out there. Whoa. And this one in particular, the one I am sort of scrolling down, is extremely tall. I'm looking at that. That's got to be a good seven feet. Also, there is a little table over here. Take a look at this. Early 19th century table. Um, I wouldn't dispute the date too heavily. $1,500? Not a chance. This is not New York City. Well, the only piece that I saw in that shop that really appealed to me, because I'm not a clock person, was that pretty little table. Um, but $1,500 is uh, like a, it's a gonzo price. That is a, you know, that is a high-end antique shop in New York City or Los Angeles price. Um, realistically speaking, nice table. Is it worth that kind of money? No. No. It's just overpriced. Uh, I don't know very much about clocks. Clocks is a specialty area of collecting buying selling if you decide you want an antique or vintage clock your best bet is to talk to someone who really knows what they're talking about because the factors that go into uh, the value of a clock can be all over the place it can be a certain type of face or dial a certain manufacturer, even like a certain location of, of manufacture. Um, it, people spend their whole lives studying clocks. So that is out of my wheelhouse. I can pick apart the, the case, the wood bits, 
because I know wood and I know the styles of antique furniture. But clocks, no, it's so much more than that. So am I in a position to say those clocks were or were not worth what they were asking? No, absolutely not. What I can say is they were asking $1,500 for a table that in our market probably shouldn't have gone above 400 and I would consider that high. Does that make me think, oh, I'm going to get a great deal on their clocks? Not even close. So, thought we'd enjoy taking a look at that. Um, same shop, fretwork bookcase. Let's take a look. All right, same booth as the grandfather clocks. We've got a little fretwork bookcase here. Um, 525, let me check and make sure I'm correct on that. Yes, 525. Um, I have not fully checked it for damage. That is something, a piece like this, you'd probably spend a good 15, 20 minutes checking for damage before you purchased it because that fretwork's very intricate and it would be very, very easy to miss some damage. On the other hand, if I wanted a piece like that, I would move my butt over to Lutz and I would grab one of their little intricate whatnots, which if you'll recall, were a lot less expensive. All right, do you remember what what would uh, be um, the fretwork whatnots, which are basically corner bookcases. Do you remember what they were going for over at Lutz? If I wanted a piece like that, I would just go down the street. By the way, it literally is down the street. Down the street to Lutz and grab one of their pieces instead. Uh, I believe this this little booth is just absurdly overpriced. I don't know what to tell you. Um, and the problem with that, as a buyer, not even talking about reselling, as a buyer, when I go into a booth and I see things that are just seriously overpriced, I don't trust them on anything. You know, and that's just my suspicion. As a buyer going in there, if I'm looking at this saying, well, this is much higher than it should be. I'm going to assume that everything is much higher than it should be. So what can I say? I'm sure I am not the only person who thinks that way. Okay, next thing, we crawled right back into my wheelhouse again from going into a little booth where I have no clue what's going on. Found a piece I didn't know. I did not buy it. So let's take a look at this. I found this piece. Um, large dinner plate, $11, um, pretty heavily gilded, nice looking piece. It's uh, Chinese, the Thousand Flowers design. Problem is, Princess House. Andrea by Sadek, I would have taken it. Princess House, no. Yeah, that is a Femiel Rose piece, but Princess House, no. At this point, we're talking about porcelain that is comparable to Avon perfume bottles, only without the Avon perfume bottle collectors out there. Would I get that? Not a chance. Would I buy something, the same piece, if the label were uh, Andrea by Sadek instead? Yes, because the quality was higher and that can justify the resale. If I were to get a piece like that, at $11, it's not a bad price. That would be you know, that would be the plate I would use, you know, to throw the food out of the oven onto in the kitchen, transport it to the table, 
and then put it on something nice. That would not be, it would never go into my china set. Um, it, I don't know what to say. I, my cat's dish is better quality. My dog's dish, my, my late dog, she, you know, she's been gone for almost a year, a year Halloween. My late dog's dish are much better quality. Uh, so what can I say? I literally would not feed my animals on something from Princess House. No disrespect to the company. Uh, I'm sure they are filling a niche, but it is a very low end niche. So just always check your labels because when you flip that plate over, there was that Princess House label and I could easily see anybody, myself included, picking up a plate like that saying, well, you know, it's modern, could be um, uh, one of the Japan decorated in Hong Kong pieces. Well, I would be very sorry if I had fallen into that trap. So, just so you know, there are gradations. And even something like Andrea Bysatic, when the, the pieces were custom made to their specifications, still much higher quality. And you don't have a lot of trouble reselling those pieces. A princess house piece, well, I would not even be comfortable calling it Famille Rose unless I put it in quotes. Um, all right, now, this time, we are going into that little corner shop. We've been in there before. I've gotten a lot of interesting little things, little teapot, salt and pepper shakers, um, some little cream and sugar from Japan. They turn their stock frequently, something I always love in a dealer. And they have interesting stuff. I grab five pieces from the shop just today. So let's take a look. All right, this little booth is a place where I have gotten some very, very interesting pieces and very good deals. This, here, let me show you, is a raised candy dish, uh, Japan Lefton. Uh, that is on my list and I'm going to have to do that. I'm going to have to share with you that list I have of the importers of Japanese goods, which include some of the trade names the Japanese companies used in the U.S. Lefton, this is one of them. Nice piece, hand-painted, hand-gilded, Japan, $8. Yeah, I think that will come home with me. Now, keep in mind, when I buy something for $8, just to make it basically worth my while, uh, and that includes just the amount of time to buy it, um, take it home, scrub it up, put it in, shipping, fees, etc., etc., we're looking at something that probably cannot go out of my shop for under 20 and I really have to be cautious when I end up with pieces that are going to have to be priced a little higher than average because I like to keep things under $20. A piece like this, if I have to go a couple of dollars over that $20 mark, I think it will be worthwhile. I think somebody will agree with me. Same booth as the pedestal candy dish by Lefton. This is a hand-painted, egg-shaped trinket box. Very pretty. Not left in New Orleans. Not New Orleans. New Orleans, which is another of those Japanese import companies. Um, and yes, I am absolutely going to go through my list with you. Well, we have a pair of very pretty little embossed gilded vases here, unmarked, but 
I've seen these pieces before. They are Japanese imports, but the kind that are marked with stickers rather than printed on the bottom. Um, a Lefton or Lego, I don't recall which. On the other hand, just because I saw pieces like that with the Lefton sticker or the Lego sticker does not mean that Ralco, Inesco, any of the others didn't import them as well. Pair, $5. Oh, yeah. Take a look at this, though. Here, let me set it down so I can back away so you can see the whole thing. That is a really sweet Noritake vase from the Nippon period, which means it's older than most. Doesn't look it, does it? Very contemporary design, contemporary style. Yeah. Uh, price on this, $8. And this is all coming from that same shop. And by the way, I'm not through with it yet. Okay, same shop still. $5, candlestick, um, definitely Japanese. It's unmarked. Doesn't matter. I mean, I, this is Japanese. This piece is a very nice piece. Uh, are we? Yes, this is Japanese as well. Tarnish proof. So, no silver polish needed, just buff it up. Very heavy. I would not be surprised if this weighed upwards of, you know, 20 ounces. Nice little piece, nice little bud vase. Let's take a look here. $5. I think both of those are probably going to come with me, simply because they are really really high quality pieces for pocket change. This piece in the back, $8. Some sort of bowl or planter. Very heavy, interesting piece, good shape, nicely gilt. I don't know. I'll have to think about that. Okay, so that was that was a nice little haul. There was the uh, the little egg shaped trinket dish, um, the set of gilded embossed vases. By the way, it was Lugine. I, I was saying it was either Lefton or Lego that that imported pieces like that. It was Lugines, um, and they often did pieces like that. Uh, then the, uh, the Noritake Nippon era vase. Three, three, yes. The candlestick and the other more modern vase with the Kawa lilies on it. So, now we've got the why I have my phone with me. Alright, this is a list of companies and well, they are company names that were importing Japanese goods. And in the past, I've told you there's just so many of them. Well, the last couple of weeks, I've been compiling a list. Whenever a name thinks of me, I stick it in my list. Relco, Norco, Norleans, Lefton, Otagiri, Takahashi, these two are actually uh, based or were actually based in the U.S. and brought things in from Japan. The other companies were based in Japan and exported to the U.S. Lego, Lugines, Anesco, Isky, I-S-C-Y, no idea how you pronounce that, and Thames, which is not Thames, it's, it's Thames, I think. Well, let me put it this way. In Rhode Island, there is a street called Thames in Newport, and it's not called Thames, it's Thames. Those are, a, it's a partial list of these Japanese import and export companies 
they were huge in the years after the Second World War. Just incredible number of companies. Uh, some companies would use multiple trade names and that's how their things would come into the U.S. They wanted names that we as Americans could relate to. So, you know, Revco, Norleans, no, it was Relco. Revco is a different, totally different. That is actually an American company. Relco, Norleans, Lego. Lego, just like the little building blocks. I'm surprised there wasn't a trade name issue about that. But all of these companies, most of them marked their products with little foil stickers. And they would occasionally, I see this with larger companies like Lefton, where they actually imprint their name on the goods, either with a glaze, so it's sort of painted on, or literally embossed right into the piece. Most of the smaller companies, little foil sticker. So I am going to continue to work on that list because I want you to have that available to you so you'll know the names when you see them. You know, you don't have to worry about it. It's just like, oh, look, Relco, that was a Japanese importer. Thames or Thames, that's a Japanese importer, so that you recognize them when you see them. Good quality stuff. Seriously, this was, it was designed for an American market. They knew the standards had to be high. All right, so we're, I was going to say we're starting to run out of time. I think we ran out of time five minutes ago. Um, I am going to continue this uh, probably on Monday. And the reason why is I walked through there. I saw some things. I said to myself, oh, I'm going to buy this. I'm going to buy that. And I did actually buy a large piece of, you know, a large case piece of furniture. I have no idea where I'm going to put it, but I'm going to find a place for it because it, it oh, I know. I, I'm just sitting here thinking I need to call a therapist. Really, I do. It was simply too good a deal to pass up. And if I have to move it out into the schoolhouse and let it hold bubble wrap and tape and little boxes for my packing materials, so be it, because I was not leaving it behind. And that happens every now and then. I will see something and it's just too good a deal to walk away from. So that's what you have to look forward to for the Bedford video part two. All right, now remember, um, I need you folks to let me know if you're okay with me working without the tape. If you are, um, I'll probably be working without the tape. You know, well, it depends. You know, it's, it's medical. It depends upon how well it works out. But if you're okay with this, I'll do it again. If this is something that's making it hard for you to understand me, or quite frankly, hard for you to look at me, let me know. You know, this is not supposed to be, you know, oh, let's see how much Bell's palsy sensitivity we can generate out there. I don't want to make you folks uncomfortable. So let me have your feedback on that. Tomorrow, we are going to have the winner of the Peacock Vase announced. And Fingers crossed we may be able to do a shop spotlight for tomorrow. I don't know. We'll see how that goes. All right. Have a great day, everyone. I'll see you later.